So welcome back to the dive line, and I have a very good friend with me, Matt Island, friend of the of the show, friend of the podcast. Uh, you would have seen Matt before when we did some of the river cleanups, and we're looking forward to doing those again in 2021. But today, what we're going to do, Matt, is we're going to have a chat about some books, aren't we? And we're both avid readers, and uh, specifically dive related books. And uh, so, where should we start? I think um, probably the most famous of them all. Uh, Shadow Divers is uh, one that you and I both love. Yep, without a doubt. Uh, what a tone. Um, that was one of the earlier uh, diving books that I ever read, I think, and it just absolutely captivated me. Uh, that was, uh, it's, it's the old adage, you know, it is a real page turner. And without a doubt, I've, I flew through that book. I was just absolutely enthralled. Um, and then I just you just sort of start noticing more the, the, the names popping up again and again in, in various other books and, and just what they've actually managed to achieve is incredible. Yeah, so, well, a little bit of, uh, about Shadow Divers. It, it's a, a story about two weekend recreational divers that solve a historical mystery. That's the, the, the basis of the story. It's John Chatterton and Richie Collar, uh, who are both, at the time, very, very experienced wreck divers. In the late 80s, they've been diving on the Andrea Doria, which is 230-odd foot on air on twin air tanks and, and everything that that entails. I mean, you and I, you know, 2021, they're doing this in, in the late 80s, and, and we just think that, you know, you just wouldn't do it now on, on air. But Trimix, Trimix was only just starting to uh, to come to the fore. And, but these guys are diving at over 200 foot on air, uh, narcosis and, you know, all of the problems that that, that brings. But very, very experienced at, at, at what they do. Um, then uh, John Chatterton was working on a, uh, a very famous wreck. Uh, I'm sorry, working, rewind that. He was uh, working on a very famous dive boat, the Seeker, uh, and with an even more uh, infamous, uh, should we say, uh, skipper, uh, Billy Nagel, who was uh, a little bit of a drinker and uh, uh, was quite well known on the east coast of America, up off of uh, New Jersey area. Uh, and he, uh, Billy Nagel, was given some coordinates by a fisherman who had lost his nets. And normally that's because there's a wreck down there and it hasn't been marked. They're not expecting a wreck. And so he gave Billy, uh, being a, a, a dive boat captain, these coordinates. He said, you know, if you get my nets back, great, but I lost a load of nets there. There must be a wreck down there at somewhere around the 200 foot. Enter the, the, from stage left. Uh, John Shatterton and his dive buddy, Richie Collar, uh, and they dive and find out that it's actually a U-boat, but no U-boat had ever been reported in that area. Uh, that It was unknown. It wasn't in the history books. It had gone down with all its crew. Uh, and that's the the basis of the story of the Shadow Divers in, in how... They discovered the wreck, how they explored the wreck, and some of the tragedies that happened during that experience, um, and uh, the 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 number of years it took to actually identify the wreck. Phenomenal, it really was, and the, the twists and turns that the whole story takes, especially identifying it, is just amazing, and it just shows how sometimes history can be recorded. Wrong, perhaps, is maybe maybe the best way. But without giving too many spoilers for the, those who haven't read it and want to read it, it really is uh, a, f a phenomenal read. Um, just absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, and I think it's a phenomenal read. A lot of that is to do with Robert Curzon. So Robert Curzon is the uh, the author of both Shadow Divers and another book that we'll come to also featuring um, John Chatterton in a moment. We'll come back to that. Um, but the way Robert writes and and the the uh, the closeness of the relationship that he managed to build with John Chatterton and Richie Collar, uh, he'll describe that dive. You think you're down there with them. I mean, it, it, the way it's written is just fantastic. It's like you're looking through your own mask at these guys sort of 10 foot away from you. It's just the, the way it rolls and the way it flows. The book is just, yeah, his descriptions are A1, 
without a doubt. Mentioned just before, there was a couple of tragedies, wasn't there, during the the the, the process of trying to establish what the U boat was, which U boat it was. Yeah, and, uh, and 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 again, going just diving on air to them sort of depths, it's that was a, such a risky undertaking at the time. Which you know, technology has moved on now. And we can do it a lot safer. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's always pioneers about who are always just pushing the envelope just a little bit further. And sadly, there is always consequences for that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, they established that the wreck was at 230 foot uh, for for a number of years. It was referred to as the you who because mm -hmm. they kept going back every year trying to find some element uh on that wreck that would identify which u-boat it was as we said earlier there shouldn't have been a u-boat there this is 60 miles equidistance off the coast of new york and new jersey if you drew a triangle out in the atlantic uh german u-boat that, that no one knew that it was there no one knew it had been sunk history didn't show in the history books that there was a, a german u-boat there uh and it, it took a number of years but unfortunately um during some of the dives there there was a couple of deaths um and that sort of leads us into the second book um two characters that were introduced to us during uh the reading of shadow divers were chris and chrissy rouse uh and there is the book by bernie chowdhury the last dive now bernie chowdhury also he started scuba diving in 1984 a very very experienced technical diver in fact he was uh, the the publisher of um, Immersed uh, Technical Dive magazine back in the day when when uh, we're going from twin tanks and air and, and tri mixes are coming out and the word technical diving had sort of started being used. He was actually a publisher uh, mm -hmm. and he wrote this book about his two friends, Chris and Chrissy Rouse, that 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 actually unfortunately died uh, in the U boat uh, that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, again, diving on air, that sort of depth is, again, very risky. Uh, these are a father and son team who, they, the way you read the last dive, they, it does seem like they are rather gung-ho about their approach in sort of some respects, but in other respects, they seem very methodical and not so much risk takers, but it just does go to show what can go wrong um, and it can have tragic consequences at that sort of depth. It's interesting you should say that because when you read about them in shadow divers, you very much get the impression that the attitude was gung ho. When you read the the last dive, you change your opinion of Chris and Chrissy Rouse. They were very involved in the industry. In fact, Chris, the father, uh, actually was inventing and building uh, submersible vehicles. He was very much uh, involved in the industry, uh, and they were very big cave divers and their cave diving they took really seriously didn't they yeah yeah they did and uh so yeah with without reading uh the last dive you would just think they it's kind of like they just strapped a tank dumped in and hope for the best but you then realize that actually that that's not quite the case of what happened the, the last dive does open up the sort of debate as to whether it was avoidable or not um the tragedy it's Again, and there's an element of risk, especially, you know, in, in a wreck that deep on air that sort of time of year. And as well, uh, the location of this wreck, it's it's not the Caribbean or the Red Sea. It's not a year round wreck. You can't you can't just go out to it any day of the year. Can you? It's a very going back to shadow dives is a very limited sort of window of opportunity they had and the costs of getting themselves out there. It, it led to a very maybe a bit more of a, um you know under pressure excuse the pun sort of time frame you can't you can't just finish one week and go out again the next week because if the weather's turned that's it for the year you've got to wait yeah uh, and very much so they 60 miles out they were going out you know it, they'd be on the wreck for two or three days at sitting at anchor um and as you say a limited window two dives a day, no more at that sort of depth that they're, they're diving. Surface interval in between the two dives obviously needs to be of sufficient length. So you're never going to get more than two dives a day. And they would spend two or three days out at anchor, 60 miles out in the Atlantic and dealing with the sort of conditions you'd expect in that environment. Yeah, not flat, calm, 
not a shorty wetsuit diving, is it? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, cer certainly not. Although I was interested to read in in the uh, in Shadow Divers how uh, I think uh, Richie Collar took a long time to to go from uh, his favoured red wetsuit to actually get into a dry suit, but that's another whole story. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but yeah, um, yeah. The the last time, if you if you read Shadow Divers and you enjoy it, then a, a good follow on is definitely. The last dive um because it just opens up the whole story just that just that bit more it really does yeah um before we move on to our next book also written by robert curzon um one thing that i found very interesting um that shadow divers is not just about diving and uh, on on a u-boat to establish the identity they traveled the world they went to germany they came to the uk they uh, you know they they went through a, a massive amount of research besides just the the dives uh and a book that that often gets referred to specifically uh about submarines and anyone that's got any interest in submarines i just will quickly mention the two books by Clay Blair, um, they're not little books. They, they, these are rather hefty doorstop type <laughs> books. But there is nothing about submarines from the world, Second World War period that isn't covered, uh, detailing the crew, the history, the models of every single U-boat. Uh, so if you actually get interested in the U-boat side of the story of Shadow Divers, I immediately, as I did, because obviously I've got the twos, so I, I uh, um, went out and uh, found them on eBay. They're out of print, but found them very easily on on a uh, um, on eBay. There are other platforms available to buy from. <laughs> but but uh, so yeah, I thought I'd just mention those because if anyone's got any interest in U boats, they they are the authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've not actually read them myself, um, but they are on my watch list. I will get round to buying them. Uh, maybe January, February time at some point, just for just for handy points of reference. Exactly that. They're, they're reference books. They're not, you're not going to read them cover to cover, but something will come up in another book and it'll mention a U-boat and you'll flick back to those books to reference that model and who the crew were and where, you know, where, where its missions were and really interesting facts to, to be found in, in uh, those for reference. So that then leads us on, as I said, the second Robert Curson book, um, also uh, a uh, story that features John Chatterton, uh, and that's Pirate Hunters. This was great. You want to kick off on this one? After reading Shadow Divers, you then find out Pirate Hunters existed, um, immediately buying a copy and starting it and just ripping through it because it was just, again, Can't such a... Down. Yeah, just the way it's written, the whole story, again, the history behind it, I mean, I had no idea um, about, you know, the UK's most notorious pirate. I had no idea. Never never sort of crossed my mind. And just the story of him and and also, the, again, the aggravation that, that John goes through trying to actually find this dive site in the first place and the conditions because I can't, I can't remember off the top of my head which island it's off. Um, Dominican Republic. Right, yeah, which I don't think is one of the sort of more – upmarket caribbean islands as such um no so it's uh um so you got cuba here and then just off of cuba you got haiti uh haiti uh and then the the right hand side of haiti is dominican republic yeah so it's not it's still it's, very very western caribbean yeah and it's not uh not particularly i don't i don't know what the best way to put it it's not it's not your sort of five star accommodation kind of place, is it? Really? No, no. It's quite a poor island. Yes. It's, uh... So uh, you know, it's just yeah. It was sort of kind of hard work all the way, wasn't it? But the reward. Yeah. So the the story is that that they're on a hunt for the golden fleece and that the golden fleece is the pirate ship of as you just mentioned a, a notorious pirate um whose name's just gone out of my head bannister um joseph bannister uh and uh um that john is actually with a, another treasure hunter friend of his another john john matera and the two of them have been planning a completely different treasure hunt 
for over two years, and they're also, by coincidence, in Dominican Republic. And they're, they're now there, they've moved there, the two of them, ready to start this mission to go on a treasure hunt for a completely different ship called the uh, San Bartolome, uh, was what they were actually about to start on. And all of a sudden they get a phone call from to probably one of the world's most famous treasure hunters, a, a guy named Tracy Bowden, an American who lived in Miami. And he called him uh, John up and said, John, you've got to come to Miami. And he said, well, we're just about to start this this uh, um, job that we're, we're doing. And no, 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 you have to come to Miami. So they well, it's two hours. We can do it there and back in the same day. Let's go and see what, you know, this guy is a serious player in the treasure hunting world. Let's go and see what he's got to say. And and we won't spoil the book, but that's the start of why after two years of planning, they decide not to look for the San Bartolome, but to hunt for the Golden Fleece and the, the treasures that are on it. Just gripping book. I couldn't put it down once I started. Yeah, and, and this one's, the, the complete opposite to shallow dive is in regards to depths and stuff like that. It's it's not anything, you know, deep and technical. It's but it, it's it's kind of more about the history of it that this book necessarily, I suppose, than and yeah, and, and the and the methods of finding it. But yeah, just a, a, a phenomenal, phenomenal read again, without a doubt. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I mean, uh, um, and again, we we'll, we'll try not to give too much away because we want people to enjoy the books as you and I did. But um, John actually was very unsuccessful in finding this wreck, and it was an incredibly frustrating process until they started thinking like pirates. Mm -hmm. And once yeah. they put themselves in the mindset of a pirate, things changed for them. That's pretty much sort of how it went, isn't it? Yes, yeah, and it's... It's quite difficult not to give too much away, isn't it? <laughs> that's that's half the challenge. Uh, yeah. There's no point us so, about the whole thing. won't read it then. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, they're, they're, they're both written by uh, Robert Curzon, brilliant, brilliant writer. He puts you there as if you're there yourself. Uh, start off with, with uh, I'll put them the right way around. Start off with Shadow Divers follow up with pirate hunters and in between the two if you want a quick read through a, a reasonable size paperback the last dive uh is a fantastic book by bernie chowdhury who's a very experienced diver so writes it from a diver's point of view so where did you go from there uh, this is a brad matson book um I, it sounds like we're the biggest john chatterton fans in the world but it's, <laughs> but it's so fascinating this is well, another about, other divers are available <laughs> good you've just read this one so i'll let you start on this matt right so titanic's last mystery secrets um quite probably the ultimate shipwreck I would say the Titanic is it's got to be the world, the world's most famous wreck, hasn't it? Let's yeah. be honest. Um, so John gets contacted by a lawyer um, who's been on a submersible that the there's a Russian ship that runs basically tourist uh, trips. Um, presumably rather expensive trips in submersible. Well, right, let me interrupt you for one moment because I used the exact words you used to John Chatterton when I was chatting to him recently because he's been on yeah. the uh, on the podcast, as you know. And he very quickly corrected me in saying that the, the tourist element was only to raise some extra money from the spare seats. They were actually doing scientific research. And right. the Russians provided the, 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 the ability for... for um, research facilities around the world, anyone that, you know, university, or whatever, wanted to do some research, they would provide the platform and the submersibles, but a really expensive process. And there was always the odd seat available that they could charge a very wealthy person that, that ha was just literally a tourist, as you just said, to go along. But it wasn't actually a tourist setup. That was a mistake I made too. Right, I'm with you. So, yeah, but there's always this option of buying buying yourself a seat to visit Correct. the Titanic. Yeah. So this, yeah. this lawyer had been down and done such a thing, and he described what he'd seen to John. He was really excited about it and said that it's, it wasn't what he expected. Again, I'm trying not to give too much away. And it, it it was a case of there was the opportunity there to go and visit himself, but it was a it was a decision he'd have to make pretty sharpish. And it might open up the door to proving beyond all reasonable doubt what actually happened 
with the Titanic. And this is a debate that's been going on since it sunk over a hundred years. People and it's still people still argue the case what happened and how it happened to this day. And even with this book, I think some people still will. Yeah, I think the the the, the real uh, quest for knowledge was why it went down so fast. Everyone knows the iceberg story and whether it hit the side or the you know, port side bow or whether there was a split in it. Everyone knows there's an iceberg involved. But what didn't make sense to people that understand ship design is why it's Titanic went down so quickly. And if it had stayed afloat for just two more hours, 2,000 people would have been saved. That's yeah. all they needed. Um, mm -hmm. But for the size of the ship and the amount of air in that hull, it should never have gone down. Or yeah. it didn't make any sense why it went down as mm -hmm. fast as all the witnesses described. And, yeah. and the reason why half the lifeboats were empty, and a lot of people can't understand that, why did they just left the lifeboats go and there was empty seats in them, is because no one on board believed that the ship would go down before they could be rescued. They they thought that, they, what's the point of getting in a lifeboat when I can step it's off? Unsinkable ship. It's unsinkable. The Titanic's unsinkable. It's not going down. This is just exactly. a minor beach. Yeah. Why do exactly. I want to leave the warm comfort of the Titanic to get in a creaky little lifeboat when I'll have to get back out? I'd rather just have a ship come alongside and just step across the gangway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and so that's where that the, this whole pro process started was uh, John and again Richie Collar put together um, a charter. Imagine you and I go, yeah, let's let's charter a boat and go for a dive. We spend a few hundred quid. This yeah. was three hundred grand. This yeah. cost them, you know, to to put this mission together to 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 hire the the, the submersibles and the Russian ship that that had the submersibles uh, uh, um, uh, on there and go out and. Uh, and discover information that changed the history of of, uh, of the um, proved why Titanic went down, and we won't spoil that. But um, but there's another element to this book, isn't there? Um, yeah, I was just also going to say, going back to the whole the half empty lifeboats. There's an account. There was a, a lord and lady who got on, and I can't remember the names off the top of my head, but he was absolutely chastised for being a survivor because everyone kept saying why why were you on board when there were still women and children left on the boat and it's just like because nobody else wanted to go on it so yeah. you know and his, his his wife didn't want to leave him so he went and it was again still half empty so it wasn't a case of him saying to all the women and children well tough you know i'm, I'm going, going. Yeah, no, no they couldn't persuade anybody to go on on these lifeboats yeah, no one believed it would have gone down in the sort of speed that it went down. And a lot of them never believed it would ever go down. But, but you know, they they ne they thought it would take a long, long time, and ships were two hours away. That that uh, you know, we yeah. know what happened. But but yeah. uh, um, but but the other element of, of of this particular book that I found fascinating, um, and over time certainly to me has been forgotten, is that this is pre commercial aircraft uh and when this happened there was two million people a year crossing the atlantic from europe to new york and to the eastern seaboard uh, of america and the book is a, an incredibly fascinating insight into the race between Cunard who, and White Star Line, who owned Titanic, and and uh, the shipyards and the characters and and the the times that those ships were built in, uh, uh, I found that element of the book incredibly fascinating because he sort of gets lost in the story a, a, a little bit. Yeah, because nobody thinks about the fact that there wasn't flights at all at this time. That, that just you want to go to America, you're on a boat for eight days. You know, and, and the, it just became the race of who could do it the quickest. And also, we also want speed, but you also want to be not too expensive because we want to get more people on board. And just the, the whole race with that and, and the race for the boatyards to build them. And just, uh, yeah, it was it was fascinating. And I've, I've visited, um, I've visited Belfast many times with work. And um, several years ago, there was a small company doing... Uh, titanic tours as long before the titanic museum and all that there 
and it would take you on a little boat up and down the river Lagan, and it would show you whereabouts Titanic was being built. And even the um, like the dock gates there are still made of the same grade steel with the same rivets because they were made at that time. Unfortunately, now that's all been developed, so it's all disappeared, which is a real shame. But um, yeah. yeah, it's a fascinating story, and and also how Harlan and Wolf sort of rode out the storm because um, the cranes the the, the the cranes are still in, up there. But I know I knew Fred Olsen bought them, and I thought I'd heard that they just burnt every single scrap of anything involved with titanic which is clearly not the case that's clearly urban legend as the book will show john and richie collar uh managed to get their hands on again involving a you know this isn't a story just about a dive into some sub submersibles and going down and seeing the titanic although that element is incredibly fascinating again of you know the, the just the, the the descent and starting off on the surface in 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 a pair of shorts and and by the time you're in the bottom you're in your thermals and your <laughs> and coats yes. and uh, and, the, and the whole process but 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 also it involved a lot of travel to ireland and to the shipyards and and uh they found some information that nobody believed existed uh again a fascinating read and again uh brad matson who's the author he he portrays it so well and just because it's not just all the happy story the, the lows that john and richie must have gone through as well when you're reading it is you i just felt defeated out you know i dread to think how much more defeated they felt with the turns that went wrong and this that and the other and you just think well it, it's just so well written it really yeah. was a page turn and it's you know it's a hell of a lot of an account from from at the time which has obviously taken a lot of research you know, into the inquests and all this, that, and the other. It was, um, it was a really good read. Yeah, I thought so. So that's Titanic's Last Secrets uh, by uh, Brad Matson. Uh, yeah, you go. You have your copy there. Uh, a, 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 a must read. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So, Absolutely. where do we go next? Uh, so, I would say leading on from that would be, if I can get it in the camera, Wish you the, the last. Olympian, yes, I understand why you've gone to that next. Tell us about it. So this uh, will link in with Titanic's Last Secrets because this is by Richie Cola, and this is a story of one of the sister ships to the Titanic, the Britannic, which they actually went and, and dived because it's been lost off the Greek coast. Um, it was, it never actually went into service as a passenger liner because it was commissioned for the war. Um, it got torpedo, uh, sorry, it hit a mine. Uh, on its way to Gallipoli to pick up um, British casualties in the war with Turkey. Um, the Germans argued that it actually was a was a troop ship. Um, the British obviously argued it wasn't. That's been going on for an awful long time. And from from memory, because it's been a while since I've read it, I think they actually there was there was no evidence whatsoever on board that Richie could find that sh showed that it was a troop ship. So it kind of exonerates the Brits from that claim at least. But this, I believe, was the same time that John went out there for their research on the Titanic um, to actually dive the Britannic. And it, this is just a, a much more in-depth look at the Britannic itself. Um, yeah. so, so for those that don't know the story, there's there's the three ships. Obviously, Titanic's the most famous. The Britannic's probably the other. And then there's also the Olympic. Um, now, one little uh, interesting note is when the Olympic was stripped, um, Part of its interior now resides in a hotel in Annick, which is up near the Farne Islands, which is where we ended up staying this year um, when we went to the Farns uh, in between the lockdowns as such. We actually stayed in the very hotel uh, and breakfast every morning in a replica, basically, of the which is be the same as the Titanic. So every morning, all the wood panels are there, all the fittings, everything uh, as a little side. Um, Fantastic. And the, the Olympic was the only sort of successful one of the lot, essentially, because it, it ended up being scrapped uh, in the 60s, I think it was. Um, so it actually, you know, saw a lot of active service, the Olympic. Uh, but this book, uh, it's like I say, it, uh, it centres on the Britannic, um, which Jacques Cousteau himself actually found. Um, and this one's actually diveable. It's deep, but it's, it is diveable. Um, oh, I think it's 100 metres. I think without looking. Um, 300 foot? Yeah, yeah. So it is diveable without submersible. And it's 
it, it would be kind of like diving the Titanic because it's it's a sister ship. They were commissioned at the same time. Um, yeah. The layout some... and the, the feel of the ship inside would be as if you could dive on the Titanic, what it would be like. Jo uh, John told us a very funny story. When they first were going there, they had to get a whole load of red tape out of the way with the Greek government in being actually allowed to go on the wreck. Yeah. And after lots of conversations, the Greek authorities just threw in on a sideline, uh, uh, of course, you're not allowed inside the wreck. And they're like, what do you mean we're not allowed? That's the whole point of the dives that we've been yeah. talking about all this time is that we want to penetrate. No, no, no penetration because the bubbles you breathe out will stay inside and cause more corrosion. And so John piped up and said, what about me? I dive on a rebreather. What is this? What is rebreather? The Greek authorities asked. So he explained the closed loop and the, the scrubber system and that there's no bubbles exhaled. So said, so they said, okay, no penetration except for John Chatterton. He can go inside <laughs> on a rebreather. So John Chatterton came out of the meeting and thought, better find somebody that would sell me a rebreather then, hadn't I? <laughs> he was on a rebreather diver. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. <laughs> oh, it made me laugh. Because, that, I mean, that that part of that is, is covered in the previous book, Titanic Star Secrets, where they talk about the dives. And again, the, the aggravation they have with the Greek authorities who just just change the goalposts just to try and suit themselves. Why, but the, why? I still can't understand why they wanted to change it, um, and why they were so bothered about it. Um you know, and wanting to, you know, get rid of stuff and, and they're trying to cover something up or I don't know. Never, it just seems to be they just wanted to be a pain in the backside for no apparent reason. Yeah, it didn't make any sense. And as you say, you, you can't help being suspicious of what the motives are of why the authorities just make it so hard to die of yeah. that wreck. Uh, you know, yeah. it just uh, doesn't make sense. No, very strange. But that was a that was a very interesting read, the Olympian. Um, it's been a couple of years. And, and who was that by? That was that by Richie Collar. By Richie Collar with uh, with Charlie Hudson. So, um, but it's, it's a much more in depth look at it um, because I think that they also did some separate um, journeys out there as well to the Britannic. But that certainly, I believe, covers the same dives that are in Titanic's Last Secrets are involved with this book uh, uh, so certainly on my list that i'm going to read because i haven't got to that one yet so uh thank you for that one matt i think you got another that uh, uh, i haven't had the pleasure of yet so we've got where divers dare if i move it the hunt for the last u-boat by randall peffer so it's finally moving away from john chatterton <laughs> To a degree. Yeah, we've cl closed the John Chatterton fan club for a while. Just, just for now. So, April the 16th, 1944, the SS Pan Pennsylvania was torpedoed by the U-550. But in return, the sub was sent to the bottom by three escorts that were escorting it across the uh, Atlantic at the time. Um, over six years had passed. Nobody knew where the sub was. Uh, and in 2012... This team managed to find it. Um, so this is the last diveable U-boat uh, off the eastern seaboard of the US. Um, some of the names in it are they will interlock in with shadow divers because these these people. It's a very small amount of people at the time doing this sort of thing. Um, yeah, so there's because of the depth involved. Yes. you know these guys are sort of almost like a <laughs> the deep dive club yeah. on the eastern so, seaboard. Yeah, so th there's names in here that, that have, would have cropped. If you read Shadow Divers first, you'll recognise names in here. Uh, there's Gary Gentile. Um, there's a chap called Joe, but I'm not going to try and pronounce his surname because I'll, I'll probably get it wrong and and know my luck. He'll be he'll be watching this and, and tell me off. Um, but yeah, there's se several different names all all in, intertwined. And uh, and again, it's a good, interesting read on and again f uh, locating a wreck. And actually finding it and diving it and proving what it is, you know, beyond all reasonable doubt. So, um, yeah, it's, it ties in well with the previous books because it's another U-boat off of the eastern seaboard of America. Again, it's been several. I'm going to reread that because it's been several years since I've read it. And going back through it this afternoon, it, 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 I couldn't remember too much about it, to be honest. But 
yeah, it, I remember it being a good read, and it's definitely one one to to check out without a doubt. Excellent. I look forward to that, and and uh, uh, I think we ought to say. Um, all these books that you and I hear about, most of them, a lot of these are, are out of print, uh, and, and you can't go and just buy them off uh, off of uh, uh, the bookshelf. But you know, a little bit of searching on Amazon UK, Amazon America, um, and the same on the eBay sites and, and various other uh, uh, similar type of of, of uh, outlets, you will find these titles, particularly the ones that are out of date. I mean, I, I'm going to end on one from the 1950s that, that I love um, and, and still manage to find one very easily, uh, you know, now. Well, exactly, because when, when we previously talked about doing this, I hadn't read Titanic's Last Secrets, so I went on, I think it's World of Books, found it on there, cheap as chips, ordered it, and it turned up within about two days. It's really, especially around Christmas time, it, you know, that, that service was second to none. It really was, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah, and I just blitzed through that. I really, really did. So um, one other book, whilst we're on the this sort of deep sort of thread, is uh, Setting the Hook, um, A Diver's Return to the Andrea Daria by Peter Hunt. Again, <laughs> once again... The, that's the wreck that John and Richie really sort of, I, I believe, cut their teeth on doing their deep stuff. And it, it was kind of, it was always described as the, the Mount Everest of wreck diving. Uh, deep, difficult, doable just about if you're prepared to practice and, you know, if you, with the right sort of conditions. Um, and it just seemed like a, a real treasure trove and, and quite a hunt. And quite a fight for these guys who could who could get the most out of the wreck uh, before it's sort of too late. And this is a this is an account of a guy who decides he wants to go back um, after about twenty years absence from diving it. Um, but you haven't read this one, have you, Craig? No, no. no. Um, also on my list to uh, to get a copy of. Yeah. So it's uh, it, again, it's a well written book, and it gives quite a good insight into the Daria because I didn't know too much about it. Um, and just like, the sort of challenges that they these guys went went uh, or uh, faced because of, because of the lack of um, technology more than anything really because you know what we've what we've got available to us today is just a world away from what these guys were dealing with as we've said previously um, so the ability to go back again later on um, I mean I. I if it hadn't been for Shadow Divers and, and these other books, I would never have heard of this wreck before. So it's opened me up to it alone. And um, I, one day I would love to go and dive that. But we've got the advantage <coughs> of uh, a lot more training and technology at our fingertips. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to give too much more away about it, to be honest, because you've not read it. And I don't want to give away the ending. It's it's certainly very interesting. It's not tragic. It's but it's very interesting. And it really highlights, um, I don't really know how to put it, it highlights how a competent professional diver should be. I'll put it like that. It's it's well worth well worth a read and uh, and everyone can learn a bit from it, I think. Yeah. For those that don't know, the Andrea Doria uh, was a uh, cruise ship, a cruise liner uh, Italian. that was, what, uh, pardon? It's Italian, wasn't it? Italian, yeah, Italian cruise liner, and, and uh, um, I can't remember the length of her, but she was a big ship, and she was rammed and uh, sunk, uh, and she's sitting in 250 uh, foot to the sea bottom, laying on her port side, so the top, the starboard side of the wreck is about 200 foot. Uh, and if you go down in penetrate inside and go down inside it and you get near the bottom, you're going to be around 250 foot. And the guys it, like the, the John Chatterton's here, his name comes back again. <laughs> um, but the, but those guys that were diving it back in the in the late 80s, they only had air and they were diving it on twin tanks and spending, you know, 20 minutes on there and then decompressing on the way up using Navy dive tables. And and of course, didn't have trimix, but as they got into the 90s and trimix, uh, became more prevalent um, the whole dive became a lot safer and uh, uh, but still you need the the right mindset to be diving deep never know never mind the the right equipment um, that brings me nicely on to uh, on to another book about deep diving um, this one's not not a, um, a, a you know a story as such this is uh, deep diving by uh, 
Brett Gilliam. Um, this is fascinating. Um, this is a book that really deals with everything that, that we've just been sort of talking about there. It's about the 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 physiology the mental preparation the stress nitrogen narcosis uh uh deco stops oxygen toxi toxicity equipment all of those elements but written from somebody that was there doing it you know in those early days very very experienced twenty thousand plus dives brett has uh and if anyone's got any interest at all even though this was written 15 years ago now, this is, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, again, out of print, but I found a copy very easily. Um, a lot of the equipment has moved on in some degrees, but but the sort of things that, that he talks about, Brett, will never change. And, you know, the, the physiology and the mental, mental uh, preparation and that sort of thing. Uh, and that's a fascinating book for anyone interested in diving deep and, and some of what's required to be able to do that safely. Was he... Uh um commercial diver brett brett was a commercial diver uh and he was also a submersible operator um right, okay. so he, yeah he's dived thousands of meters in submersibles and uh uh very well known in that field right okay because that's that's a book that i've not read yet but that's going on my list to uh to to try and find and track track a copy down so that sounds interesting yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, a fascinating one. That's a, a good book. Yeah, excellent. So I'm going to bring it a lot closer to home for us. Um, I've got two two here by a Scottish chap called Rob McDonald. So he's not the man who makes the burgers. He's not the man who makes the burgers. Um, maybe it's his brother. I'm not too sure. <laughs> And again, I hope he's not watching because uh, I don't want an angry Scotsman after me. <laughs> so his first book, uh, Into the Abyss by Rod McDonald. OK, um, so he's a BSAC diver uh, and he starts off from memory in the 80s, I think it is, and just absolutely falls in love with with the ocean and diving. Uh, most of his books, it's all kind of set around Scotland um, because that's where he lives. And there's obviously plenty of diving off of, off of the Scottish coast. Uh, and then his se the sequel to that is The Darkness Below uh, by Rob McDonald. It's got a bit of a reflection off the screen there. But, yeah, this that's the follow-up. He's also written about Scapa Flow, which um, presumably most readers and uh, and listeners and viewers, rather, uh, will be aware of. If not, Scapa Flow is uh, situated off the, off the coast of the, the Orkney Islands in Scotland. And it's the site of the world's biggest maritime suicide ever. Um when at the end, near the end of the First World War, the uh, entire German Navy was interned in Scapa Flow. Um, there, again, debate rages, but they were under the impression that the war was going to continue, and they were sort of instructed in secret to set all the ships to uh, to basically uh, to scuttle them. Uh, and they were they were given the order, although there was no actual proof that the war was going to end, and they sunk most of their fleet um in, in within the harbour of, of scapa flow we're talking about a, a lot of ships it was the whole german fleet that, yes. that was held there uh at scapa flow yeah yeah the entire lot um the, the photographs that are available online of, of like the patrol the british uh escorting them rather up to scapa flow is, is quite phenomenal to see the entire fleet being you know being led up there it was uh it really was a sight to behold and it's now it's a site that I really want to go and visit myself, which just not got round to yet. Um, there's not much left. It's certainly not, you know, it's not pristine sort of conditions and whatnot. But um, but Rod's written about Scapa Flow, and it's it's been updated several times now. Uh, with, with just the passage of time, obviously these these ships are deteriorating slowly but surely. He's also written a quite a large guide to uh, shipwrecks of the UK as well. So he, he's certainly well versed in it. And th and these two books, um, it, none of them. None of his dives venture abroad um, in, within the writing. So for anyone who's got an interest in, in UK-based stuff, certainly around Scotland, they're, they're quite a, a good read and, you know, give a good insight as to, to what's about. Because uh, I've always said, you know, English and Scottish diving always seems to get overlooked a little bit. Um, I think a bit unfairly because, because it's not so warm, because it's not crystal clear vision. A lot of people just write it off. And I think last year in 2020 with the lockdown, 
and people not being able to travel, I think it might have opened up a few eyes and read a few of books like these will open up a lot more eyes and, and realise just how great the UK is for diving. Yeah, absolutely. And if, you, if you're into diving on wrecks, uh, because of the Second World War, we have some of the best wreck diving in the world. You just got to, you know, get your dry suit qualification, get some experience in, in um, conditions that aren't perhaps, you know, clear water and warm and wetsuit. And, uh, but what you'll experience if you're prepared to do that is, is fantastic. You mentioned at the right at the very beginning of that, Matt, uh, BZAC for, for our listeners in America and Australia and, and, and around the world. BZAC is a British Sub Aqua Club, so it's a training agency here in the UK. Yeah, it's been going an awful long time, isn't it, uh, BZAC? <clears throat> very, very strong uh, contingent in the UK. Um, it is worldwide, um, but it's not quite as global as some of the other ones out there. Going on to a bit more UK stuff. Uh, so this this one here, Out of the Water to Get, to get Out of the Rain, uh, by Trevor Norton, it's an autobiography by a marine biologist um, who grew up in the UK and have spent his whole time in the UK. He's, um, he's a, he was at Liverpool University, I believe, and did a lot off the Isle of Man, which is another place I'd like to visit. Um, so it's, it's not strictly a diving book as such, but there is a lot of underwater stuff based in it. And it's, a, it's just a, a good, interesting read certainly on, you know, on the coast and, and a bit of the history of the UK and, and just his life, really. It's, um, I thought it was just quite a good read. I can't remember, a friend of mine recommended it to me, I can't remember who, and so I picked up a copy and, um, yeah, that was, that was an interesting little read. And it's fairly short chapters, so it's one that's quite easy to pick up and put down, you know, if you've got a spare 15, 20 minutes, you can just quickly do a chapter, put it down and, and carry on the next day sort of thing, which is, for me personally, I prefer a book like that rather than chapters that are, you know, anything that's over an hour into it, because I like to just do it chapter by chapter rather than randomly finishing sort of halfway through. I like to get through one. So if it's a smaller chapter, I prefer it just because I can just pick it up and put it down a lot easier. Yeah, unless it's like the Titanic book that we just mentioned, because you get to the end of the chapter and you have no choice but to carry on because it grips you. <laughs> yeah, I've got to keep going without a doubt. <laughs> So I've got, and I think this is one that's on your favourite list. I think you've got a copy of this. Oh, um, Dave, David Mearns. So David is the author and the story is about him and uh, he is the shipwreck hunter. Uh, and although, again, this isn't really so much about diving, but there isn't a diver I can think of that wouldn't love this book. Uh, most of the... Um, uh, dives, if we use that word, are all three, four, five thousand meters plus, and and it's shipwreck hunting using sonar. Yeah, um, my good friend Mark Farrow put me onto this book. He read it and absolutely loved it. So I was like, "Well, oh, this sounds intriguing." So I picked up a copy and just, yeah, just completely another world in regards to diving. But what the the chap manages to do and how he manages to find them is just phenomenal and i just i would love to be on that boat and love to be involved and and just have a go as such you know just be involved with that sort of that sort of uh, what's the word um uh well just hunting i guess uh i mean the very first chapter um you know pro proving you know finding a wreck and, and proving someone's culpable of of a crime you know just yeah that's that. very interesting you, you, you it's not just about the finding of the wreck. There's a whole subplot of why they're out looking for this particular wreck. Go on, carry on about the, you're talking about the MV Lucona is yeah, the uh, very uh, first ship. Uh, um, it was Aus Austria. We, yeah. Austria is landlocked funnily enough. Yes. But it, it was Austria's biggest ever criminal trial uh, yes. that they ever had. And it all, rested on finding the Lucona and proving how it went down. Yeah, and I can't, it was, wasn't it? It was loaded with mining equipment, I think it was. Yeah, so so um, the character involved was actually a member of the of the, the uh, government's opposing party, the Socialist Party, uh, Udo Pross. Uh, and it, the plan was quite simple. So he... he uh, chartered a merchant ship, then which is the the MV Lucona, 
he made out that there was a uranium processing plant worth 15 million pounds on board, sent the ship off as if it's being delivered to Africa, and all that was on board was a whole load of worthless farm machinery, uh, and the plan was just to blow it up when it was out at sea and claim the insurance. It's, it sounds you know quite quite simple but you know because once you've blown it up at sea there's no evidence there you know to say that there wasn't a uranium uh plant uh um processing plant on board so uh that that was the story yeah i've got a fit wasn't wasn't that fine the one that really sort of launched his career am i right in thinking that that's how he really got established and proved that he was he could do what he said he could do yeah, and the way David describes that mm -hmm. event is because they've been that they have a uh, um, and I can't remember why I'd have to re I have to read it again to double check why, but they had a rough location, and what they would do is they would drop a sonar boy on the th thousands of meters of line below the ship, and do what's called mowing the lawn. They would literally go up and down and and pull the sonar behind them on a square that could be 15 miles by 15 miles or you know, whatever it was. He describes it very well in the book. And they were on the, they hadn't found the ship. It wasn't in the area and they'd been looking and looking and, uh, and the whole way, again, we don't want to spoil it for people, but if they didn't find this ship, it would really be career ending or career launching if they did find it. And I think it was on the very last line that they were towing and everyone on the ship is completely depressed it's cost again hundreds of grand to put this mission together to to get out there um he designed the equipment and and uh so there's not only his ability but his ability in the using the equipment that's at question and on the yeah. very last line of mowing the lawn they went over the top of a wreck you know yeah. at, at four thousand meters below them yeah. um now they've got to prove it's the wreck and now they've got to so then the submersibles get launched and the story goes into what they actually found and uh and that's just the very first opening i i you know again i couldn't put it down till i got to the end of the story no no same as me and there's because it, it, again it's not all plain sailing it's not all happy ends because there's one particular one i'm not going to mention the name of it or anything like that but getting really hyped up about and it just never actually happens um i'm sure you can remember which one it is so um yeah it's not it's not all uh you know cocktails and, and happy endings um the, the lows go with the highs and that's that's the, the nature of the beast but yeah like, like we say it's not a, a sort of scuba diving book as such but involving rex and i i mean it appeals to divers and non-divers alike like say my friend mark farrow put me onto it he's a diver himself but not you know just a very sort of recreational one um but he he picked it up and he absolutely loved it i'm so glad he he told me about it it's just phenomenal really really good read yeah i've got a feeling it might have been you that put it on to me i can't remember how i actually got to find out but i've got a feeling you mentioned it to me and i got found i found a copy uh on on the platforms we mentioned earlier and uh uh Gripping, yeah, yeah, really gripping. I mean, uh, yeah, um, we can mention a couple of the very, very famous. I mean, he he hunts for the hood and the Bismarck. The for yeah. those a little bit of Second World War history, the Bismarck was a big, you know, was the the German super ship. The hood sunk it um, after the the. Uh, every aircraft that the Brits owned had been trying to sink the Bismarck, find the Bismarck and sink it for a long time. And the hood was the one that finally uh, sunk it and then got sunk herself. And so yeah. um, the story of those two is fascinating. Um, one of the things that I found, you know, really admirable and it was almost a byproduct was the way lots of families that had loved ones and relatives on some of these wrecks that have been found, and they never knew where their those wrecks were. It gave them the closure that yeah. they needed. You know, all of these years later, in yeah. that they know where their loved one went down and the story and what actually happened because of the work that David had done. And and um, uh, that was uh, admirable. Some of the stories that came out of it. Yeah, the, was it the, the human side of it? Was it the SS Australia, the Australian troop ship? Sydney. 
that the Australia's biggest marine disaster, the HM, HMAS Sydney, went down in uh, uh, in the Second World War, and no one knew where or how. Or uh, and and there was a um, there's a huge story. Let people read that one. Yeah, that's uh, um, the closure that can be bought, especially with the hood. I mean, the hood and the Bismarck. I mean that the the death toll runs into thousands easily. Um, was that, was it the Battle of Jutland that happened at? I think I can't remember yes. now. In my head, I yeah. Think so. I mean the hood, you know, well over a thousand souls went down with that, you know. But the fact that the the families now know exactly where it is. Um, I mean, I can't begin to think of what it must be like for them because it's like fortunately never happened to myself. But. You know the, the fact that they know now know, and they you know if if they really wanted to, they'd be able to get like a reef out to to remember their their you know their family. It, it's just must be so comforting for them. On a happier note, I think we should yeah. head towards the end now. And uh, what have you got that you want to bring to the table to right. to finish so, with? So this is I just thought I'd go through. This is a little pile of stuff that I've not actually read yet. Um, plenty to go as as yet. Um, because obviously we've we've just talked about um, sort of novels as such, you know, the, the stories of of these divers and so on and so forth. Obviously, out there there are heaps and heaps of books all about particular dive sites, like um, Will Atwiard's uh, Wild and Temperate Seas, and he's also done like Discover UK Diving. So, whereas you know, book, books like these, they're, they're not sit down and read at night they're you know they're reference books aren't they and i've and i've also picked up so you've got the thistle gall my favorite wreck ah there you go my favorite wreck i've ever dived on going so, back this year please god in june or july no july i'm going back uh if, if we're allowed to travel yeah so um i've also got yeah, deep in the blue holes which going right back to the last dive um rob palmer he's mentioned in the last in the last dive he's um part of that scene and he's written this book which I'll, again i've bought and not got around to starting yet um reef life by callum roberts i'm quite looking forward to that it's, again it's another marine biologist by all accounts a marine scientist and it's his his life sort of you know in and around and under the water um and i can't and a couple of vintage books unfortunately there's no cover on on this one but this is under the red sea by hans haas who's an Austrian, uh, locally printed uh, to uh, me and Craig uh, by Gerald's of Norwich. By Gerald's in Norwich. Yeah. And I've also got Diving to Adventure by by him as well to, to have a read of. Um, so, I mean, again, going, going, talking about the technology and how it's moved on, to, to read, to be able to read these, um, I mean, I can't, I don't even know what year this is uh, actually published in, but it's uh, first published 1952. So, this is 70 odd year old technology now. Um, so it'd be, it'd be quite interesting to read just, just what they were up to at the time then. And I mean, the, the Red Sea must have been so much different 70 years ago. Can you imagine? <laughs> just unbelievable. Can you imagine? Well, well I, I'm, I'm going to finish with, for me, where it all started for every recreational diver that dives today. Uh, and that's here. The Silent World by Jacques Yves Cousteau. Um, mm -hmm. Written in 1953, the, he's the inventor of the aqualung and um, uh, regulator. Um, in fact, they actually had, before the regulator, they were diving with compressed air tanks with a hose going into the mask and you open the tank, took a breath and shut the tank because they didn't have a regulator. <laughs> that was how they're diving. But, but what a lot of people don't know is that Jacques Cousteau actually started diving in the 1930s in what we call today free diving so yeah. he invented a made himself a, a mask a pair of goggles and and made fins and was diving in the 1930s um then as a member of the the french navy in the second world war things developed and they were uh, um he was doing underwater discovery and invented the aqualung uh with uh emil emil cagnan who uh, was the engineer that put jack's ideas uh into fruition and started diving uh, on an aqualung with a regulator in 1943. Um, this book 
uh, and there is a film and you can find parts of that on YouTube, is published in 1953. Uh, and they got the ship Calypso, very well known, and they were, were traveling around the world uh, diving. Uh, and it's really hard when you're reading the book to remind yourself that the the year of what you're reading, because they're talking, you're picturing it, they're talking about diving on the thistle gorm or diving in the Red Sea. It, and you've got to remind yourself, this is 1947, 1948, that they're doing this. And, and uh, you know, as you just said, can you imagine what that was like then? But, yeah. um, you know, uh, and so they were the grassroots of what you and I and every other diver in the recreational diver in the world do. So I think uh, for me, that's uh, the silent world. Again, I found a copy, uh, for, I think it was about five pounds sterling, um, 1940s colour photos underwater. Yeah, it, amazing, isn't it? Just yeah. you know, <laughs> anyone that's into diving, you've got to, it's a must read, even now, today, it really is. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure there, there can't really be a diver out there who hasn't heard of Jacques Cousteau and his family and, and the legacy that it's brought along. I mean, um, is it, uh, we, there's a site which he's, they left their little underwater pods uh, that's the Red Sea, but the African side, isn't it? That's kind of a dive site now. Um, yeah. I can't think where, which coast it's off of now. Um, but yeah, the, the, the legacy that the Cousteau family has left for the diving world. And, and, and they, Jack, he really was a pioneer, wasn't he? There's, there's not that many people you can say about it, but he was of what we know and love to A real, do. true pioneer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. So, Absolutely. um <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, we we could sit here for for hours and hours and hours talking about various dive books, couldn't we? There's so many great ones about the one the one that I didn't I couldn't find the copy of mine, which I'm sure it was actually Jim told me about um, was Chase and Thunder, the Sea Shepherd book. And every diver out there really has either heard of Sea Shepherd or supports what they get up to. Um, and if you haven't got a copy, then please go out and buy a copy and support Sea Shepherd and the work they do. And the, the, that two days I read that book, front front of front to back. What a story! What a chase! Yeah. Mind blowing! Fantastic job they do. And the one thing that links, uh, you mentioned, it's not about diving, but it is about the ocean. And the ocean is the thing that links all of these books and everything we do as divers. Uh, uh, even the books that aren't specifically about diving, they are all about the ocean. And that's the thing. That's the link that brings all of this together and uh, uh, all of us together. All of the books we've mentioned, I will put links in the bio, see on our YouTube channel, The Dive Line, to leave your comments and remarks. And we'd love to hear the books we don't know about and the books that you love. Uh, tell us about those so that Matt and I uh, can expand our horizons too. Absolutely, yeah. I'm always up for a bit more reading, uh, reading activity. I love it. Um, I'm a proper bookworm. I always have been. I'm sure I always will be. Yeah, no, I've really enjoyed our chat, Craig. It's been great. Excellent. Well, no, we really appreciate you coming on. We'll do it again. We'll see what comments we get and perhaps we'll have some more reading and in a few months' time we'll we'll have another review and, and uh, tell people about some others. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we can sit in the sunshine and do it. <laughs> yeah please god yeah some yeah. somewhere nice uh, before or after a dive one evening when we're diving the next day absolutely perfect that would be brilliant so uh, thank you very much from matt and me craig uh please subscribe you'll get notification uh, as soon as we put anything new out uh and we'll put the links below lovely thank you ever so much craig cheers it's been a pleasure